Welcome everyone to the online series Talking Asia Politics, the Age of Asia, China India Dialogue, organized by the Hans Seidel Foundation. My name is uh, Dr. Jesper Svensson and I'm the moderator for today's China in uh, India Dialogue on the role of civil society in fighting water pollution. Asia has a number of distinct features. It is home to 54% of the world's urban population with the highest concentration of mega cities. Not only are Asia cities big and numerous, but they are also among the most polluted. Providing safe water and sanitation are among the top policy priorities in both China and India. The, env the environmental, social and economic limits of the current mode of production and consumption highlight the necessity of a transition towards a sustainable alternative. In China and India, NGOs play a vital role in implementing the regulations against pollution. Yet, our understanding of how civil society organizations interact with governments, businesses and resource users to protect water resources is lacking. In this special online series, we are interested in discussing the following. How NGOs in India and China develop strategies to protect water resources whether and how NGOs engage in scaling up management practices to national and international levels, the role of environmental education in solving water pollution problems, as well as barriers that may impede it. Joining us to discuss these issues are two leading environmental experts and NGO representatives from China and India. The first dis distinguished speaker is Mr. Kartakeya Sarabhai. Uh, he's the founder and director of the Center for Environment Education, a national institution engaged in promoting environmental awareness and conservation, as well as education for sustainable development. Starting in Ahmedabad in 1984, CEE today reaches into every school system in India in every Indian language and advising every state government on greeting the curriculum. CEE is also active internationally including in Australia and Sri Lanka. In 2005, his organization received the Global Award for Outstanding Service to Environmental Education from the North American Association for Environmental Education. Mr. Sarapai was instrumental in initiating the South and Southeast Asia Network for Environmental Education. He is internationally recognized as one of the world's leading environmental educators, and he has received several awards, including the Padma Shri, India's fourth highest civilian award in 2012. The second distinguished speaker is Mr. Xin Hao, the executive director and co-founder of Green Zhejiang, Zhejiang province's first and largest environmental NGO. He developed an interactive collaborative pollution map that won the UNIPs Eco Peace Leadership Urban Planning Excellence Award. In addition, he promoted the idea of river champions policy to the municipal government which then nominated him as the head of the River Champions. From 2013 to 2015, he won all three gold medals at the China Charity Projects competition. Mr. Xin Hao has also been honored by receiving the Youth Elite Medal of China, the China Ecological Civilization Award, the China National Mother River Award, the Gold Medal of China for Voluntary Service, and the Youth Elite Medal of Zhejiang Province. House commentary on a wide range of envir environmental issues has appeared in 650 national and provincial newspapers and magazines. He is currently pursuing a PhD at the School of Management at Zhejiang University. After uh, this gentleman's presentation, we will have a moderated Q&A period from the audience. You may use the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen to enter questions into the queue. Thank you very much. And Katakea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the Ansidal Foundation for this opportunity to share. I'm particularly looking forward to the presentation from China and uh, look forward to what possibly we could also do together. Uh, as you know, this region has a large part of the world's population. India itself is about 18% of 
of the world population with uh, about two and a half percent of its land, a four percent of the fresh water resources. We have 400 plus rivers, but 13 major river basins. And we have a very long uh, coastline, uh, uh, including the islands which, which happen in India. Now, India became independent in 1947. And in the constitution itself, the right to, uh, uh, right to life included a pollution-free water environment. And this is a very important part of the constitution, but along with it was also Article 51A, which talks about the duty of every citizen. The constitution of every citizen's responsibility to protect the environment, the duty of every citizen. So you have the right to good, clean water, but you also have the duty of, of looking after it. Now, this was a very difficult thing for a new nation which was facing a lot of problems. And at the Stockholm conference in 1972, which, as you know, it was one of the first conferences, we put a lot of priority in it. And uh, the Indian prime minister was the only head of government who actually attended that first conference. Uh, and uh, Indira Gandhi, and what she said was that how do we talk to villagers or people living in slums when uh, and talk about rivers and air pollution when there is such poverty and and environment cannot be improved in conditions of poverty but she went on to say that you cannot actually solve poverty issues unless you solve environmental issues so i think right from the beginning it was realized that while it was a difficult task we had to uh, come up and, and do something uh, about it the First part of legislation came a couple of years later, two years later, the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act was enacted in 1974. And we set up a central pollution control board and state uh, pollution control boards. Later on, there are several acts, including the Environment Protection Act of 1986, which talks of uh, mandatory environmental impact assessment for large projects and public consultations, getting people's views on projects which are active. So there was already uh, a sense of uh, community participation, civil society participation in the acts itself. Uh, the Center for Environment Education was set up in 84 as a center of excellence of the Ministry of Environment, Forests to Government of India, because it was recognized that an Indian strategy for change uh, and the transformation we want cannot just happen through passing legislation or, or new technologies coming in, but that you would also require uh, people's understanding, capacity building, you would need community, people to engage with policies, uh, you need uh, some research and demonstration projects to attract new ideas, you needed to strengthen the way governance happens right from the village level upwards, you need uh, institutional buildup. So CE was set up as, as was done in the introduction. We work across India in, in almost all the languages and we work at the community level as well as at the state level and the national level in this. Now, one major boost that our activity got was that in 1991, the Indian Supreme Court had a public interest litigation it was looking at. And, and the question asked was that how can you expect the constitutional duty of protecting the environment to actually be done if everyone didn't understand what the environmental issues were. And so in 91 and again in 2003, what was done was the Supreme Court directed all educational bodies to say that environmental education has to be a compulsory part of, of every formal education system. This was quite a landmark definition. We can we are still improving the quality of it, but it was a very landmark thing. On the right hand side, you see one of our early kits, uh, which was for water testing. We got students to test water in, in rivers, in lakes around themselves, uh, in, in water, just becoming conscious, not only theoretically, but going out and actually actually measuring what was what was possible. Now I'm going to talk about uh, a few projects which C has taken, which depict the type of engagement which we have as civil society. How does how do we engage with these efforts? One of the largest rivers of India is the Ganges, the Ganga. Ganga is a river which is 
uh, holy to many people in India. It's it catchments. It provides 11 states with water. Almost it's catchment area of about 26 a percent of India's land is which it services. 45% of the population. A hugely important river uh, in India today and also mythologically, emotionally, uh, it's a very important river. So here, but it is polluted. And one of the first campaigns which we took up was to see how, what sort of indicator can we give people so that they understand. And what came in handy was that the Ganges River has the dolphin, the river dolphin. And when you see the dolphin in the, in, the, in the river, it means that the water is good. The water is of good quality. So we used the dolphin as a symbol. We called it dolphin clubs. And in, in several schools in clusters, of, of almost in 35 different clusters, we had 20, 25 schools in each. We formed these dolphin clubs, which, which did activities. We got uh, the community to be involved in it. And the Ganges project also went into uh, community sensitization. Here you see on the right, you see a uh, street play being done on the banks of the river. Uh, this was a very major campaign. This particular one is from the Indian city of Varanasi where uh, it's an intensive work with 100 schools involved in it, but also all the communities. And the guards are the steps which go onto the river. And, and this is what was used. We got shopkeepers to get interested in it. We talked about plastic pollution and, and a variety of other things, creating local people to get uh, involved. A major campaign on the river was this one. It was a 14-day campaign. And you can see that there were activities in 17 different locations, again, getting people involved. Now, I was talking about these campaigns. Another type of initiative has been our youth initiative. And in the youth initiative, we put a little more emphasis on uh, behavior change, on, on getting students to monitor, uh, come up with solutions, problem solving. The one project, for instance, is called Plastic Tide Turner. We do it with the United Nations Environment Program and WWF and the Ministry of Environment and Forest. <clears throat> 325,000 young people have been trained under this project. Its focus is on plastic pollution and plastic going into the waterways, eventually ending up in the ocean. The CG Handprint Lab is a, is a study program which you do in colleges. Again, people go and try and find solutions. Wet Skills is a program we do with the Netherlands where, where groups of um, engineering students get together, take a problem relating to water, water pollution, and try and, and deal with it. Now moving on to another type of program where we talk about rural communities. And, and here, the emphasis has been not just on awareness, but on empowering the communities. Uh, we had some interesting project. The first one is in Gujarat, the uh, state in the Western India, where water comes up to the village, but we were creating a water management system in the village by the villagers to manage the water and manage clean water. Uh, the Amreli project was one where we had natural pollution. We had floor, excessive fluoride in the water. And how do you deal with pollution, which is not man-made, but is also a naturally harmful thing in there? We had this wonderful project uh, supported by the Heinz Seidel Foundation called Jal Setu. And this was specifically directed to empowering elected representatives, women elected representatives for water governance and then relating it to climate change. And again, this form of demonstrating what really can be done if people take charge of their own lives, their own decisions, but are given, the NGO gives them the type of uh, uh, training, the type of capacity building, which enables them to do this and take more, more control. A very different type of program is, is the Blue Flag. And the Blue Flag program is an international program focused on, on a beach. We have just done eight beaches in India. Uh, there are eight more which are being considered uh, tomorrow, in fact. And how do you keep beach clean? Very internationally specified standards of how you measure water pollution in these areas. 
Uh, industrial waste, again, we, this is a different type of approach because we train in, uh, people there to follow the laws uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and understand and impact how they can stop pollution there. So, so the NGO itself works with a variety of different uh, stakeholders here. And, and the emphasis is on partnerships, partnerships with NGOs, partnership with industry, uh, partnership with students, with schools, and doing joint research uh, projects. I will basically stop here. The handprint represents positive action, just like footprint represents the way you tread, but the handprint is for positive action. So we encourage people to take positive action as they go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Sarabhai. Uh, we will now move on with the next speaker. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Shinhal. Okay. So you can see my screen, right? Can you see my screen? Yes, we Hello? can see it now. Yes. We can see it now. Okay. Yeah. We can see it. So thank you for the opportunity for uh, having me to participate in this discussion. I will introduce the role of civil society fighting water pollution in China. Okay, let's uh, go back 30 years ago. So the environmental pollution accompanying rapid China's rapid industrialization. And in uh, since middle 1990s, and we have media reported a lot in environmental degradation and its consequences for citizens' health. Uh, about 15 years ago, we have a Chinese environmental NGO named IPE published the China Pollution Map, which attracted a lot of global concerns. And uh, in the year of 2013, Chinese government started to officially acknowledge the CFA problem of pollution and began to prioritize environmental governance to respond to public concerns. Now, let me talk about my province, Zhejiang. You can see the Chinese characters here. Both characters, the left part, it means water, it's the same. It looks like uh, Zhejiang has a lot of water. Uh, but you can see the data here. Zhejiang also suffered very serious water pollution. And uh, this is a report uh, like in 2009, environmental situation report of Zhejiang province. We could see only uh, less than two thirds of the waters meets the requirement for their designated surface uh, function, water function, and a high degree of huge in the rivers, as well as uh, the mouth of Chantang River, Hangzhou Bay, which is. Uh, I started the uh, environmental organization and I, I named it Green Zhejiang 21 years ago. At that time, I was a freshman of Zhejiang University and I bicycled the Zhejiang province for 36 days for more than 2000 kilometers. But at that time, I saw a lot of water pollution and uh, I was shocked. And uh, I just wanted to like start an NGO to work to protect the rivers. So the story uh, started uh, 21 years ago and uh, we experienced uh, three major phases. So at the very first phase, we, uh, like some people like me and my professor, and we wanted to save the earth and we have a group. Uh, but that's, you know, that's a, a single circle, but we didn't connect with each other. But for the second phase, we started to work with different sectors. Uh, we work with government, we work with me and uh, companies. And for the uh, recent phase, uh, we become a platform for multiple stakeholders. Uh, I will introduce our stories uh, later uh, for three parts. The first one, how we uh, involve multiple stakeholders. And you can see uh, we successfully framed water governance as an important uh, policy by mass mobilizing citizens to report their finding water pollutions in their hometown. 
And this is an interactive collaborative map uh, developed by, by us. And the people can visually illustrate the pollution and they can report pollution as well. And uh, we have collected more than 700 pollution incidents and uh, successfully solved 95% of the reported case since 2011. And by providing necessary information for the provincial government, actually Environmental Protection Bureau to supervise its subordinates implementation of environmental policy. We as an NGO also borrows some informal power from our government and uh, to let provincial authority to you know, uh, request the local government accountable both to their supervisors, supervisors and to the public. And we have simple equipment, some tools for the citizens to monitor water quality. Uh, let's go back eight years ago. It's very interesting in February, 2013. So we have a, a private entrepreneur uh, request his hometown uh, Environmental Protection Bureau chief to swim in polluted water. Uh, if he did so, he would pay like 30,000 US dollars. But this proposal was first made on a micro blog and uh, they have some uh, followers like him to request uh, EPB chief to swim in polluted water. But anyway, uh, as many as online public issues, uh, like uh, uh, a few proposals uh, tend to lose public interest after a short period of time. But we, uh, Green Zhejiang, uh, turn this flag point into a long lasting public issues. We work with over Zhejiang satellite television to start a searching for swimmable rivers TV series. And uh, in the year of that, so we reported 136 uh, reports on like pollution water. And it's really a chapter of a uh, uh, provincial government, government's concern. And we also organize some activities like a paint on the Chentang River seawall. And you can see it's almost uh, uh, 11 kilometers in length. And we worked for more than 10 years and it's all themed uh, like uh, protection water. And we organize swimming across the Chentang River uh, event as well. So that's, we involve different stakeholders. Uh, let's say uh, the second phase, so dialogue between multiple stakeholders. Uh, it's not only player A, player B, player C work with us. We also want uh, player A, B, C. They have some dialogue and uh, to work on the issues. Like we organize round table meeting. We have like a media experts, uh, government departments, general public NGOs sit together to discuss how to solve the specific problem. And uh, at that time, Green Georgia as an NGO, we have some roles like problem investigator, meeting organizer, multiple stakeholder connector and solution supervisor. Uh, you can see some round table meetings and uh, uh, previous photos and uh, after roundtable meeting, we solve the problem. I will give you another case. That's a, a cross-boundary case. And after the roundtable meeting, the water become clean. Uh, also, uh, over India friends mentioned the dolphin. Yeah, we also have some dolphin protection programs in over Mother River. And uh, because of all these efforts, we uh, uh, make the, the like you tra transition from the traditional management to multiple stakeholder governance. And Green Zhejiang also promoted a model for more inclusive environmental governance after the provincial government declared water governance as a high priority key task. So, you know, the previous model is more like uh, EBB versus polluters and uh, we want to see other stakeholders in blue, you know, uh, they are involved. Okay, the last part, how we establish uh, platforms and the mechanisms. And uh, we provide several platforms like River Chiefs and the Pollution Watch Volunteer Group, citizens can join. And we have a Green College Students Alliance, and we have more than 60 university students groups. 
and we have H20 Global River Cities Summit. We have several partners uh, in other countries as well. And I will introduce River Angels Project. Uh, this is for primary school and middle school students. Uh, you can see this program uh, work with international, uh -oh, international organizations, academic institutions, governmental departments, nonprofit, and schools, inspiring students group to select a river uh, section and become its river angels. And students are trained to become local waterway protectors and environmental interpreters and uh, water resource protector solution innovators. As of now, there are more than 100 schools and uh, more than 70,000 students join this program. And uh, the program also won outstanding uh, flagship, uh, flagship project uh, in 2019. Uh, RC network. Okay, so River Angels have three goals. The first, establish a multidisciplinary curriculum system, and the second, linking multiple stakeholders to social governance, and the third, promote a, a replicable ESD model, education for sustainable develop, uh, development model. And uh, we have four modules in this program, like, like research, innovation, action, and publicity. And uh, students can become uh, knowing water and rivers to uh, becoming a uh, earth success at five different levels. Uh, like uh, uh, students are encouraged to have direct action, like uh, patch of the rivers. They can clean up the garbage and uh, invasive species, and uh, they connect. Uh, we connect uh, urban and rural students uh, together, and, and uh, it's high tech uh, oriented. We have some unmanned. Uh, a real vehicle and unmanned surface vessels used. And uh, we have some uh, very famous person like World Skills World Achievement Champion, TV anchors, uh, football players, stars, uh, to be the advisors. And uh, students like uh, uh, photos shows, they, they tell about what stories about the old city gates and rivers. And we encourage students to use music, speeches, photos, paintings, texts, uh, uh, to promote public awareness of water, as well as to improve their listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills. And students help raise funds and uh, donated to like uh, last year to Bangladesh students for fighting COVID-19. And they believe water connects the two countries and the students in both countries should work together on water conservation. Uh, it's borderless. You know, during the H20 Global River Cities Summit, uh, more than 700 river angels talked to 10 mayors, and uh, we connect the river angels from different regions, countries like this New Zealand. Uh, a network also built, uh, this is the Chantan River watershed. Uh, like within this watershed, uh, schools are connected. Uh, we organize one Chantan River event every year, uh, have different type of activities. And uh, we encourage students to conduct in-depth thinking and research on natural science and social science issues related to labor. And uh, we organize study tours, invention competitions, like uh, you can see the bottom left is water cleaning, uh, water cleaning ship. And uh, top right, it's the water cleaning fil filter made by uh, hair green nut shows and the chalk powders. Can you imagine that? And we do advocacy. Uh, we organize students to visit the local river administration office. Express they express to the public their own their own sorts of river conservation via mass media. You can see roundtable for for the students as well. And uh, they engage in a public interest lawsuit in the mock environmental court. But it's it's really happened in in two courts. Okay, we developed the River Angels course and form a BBL, which is a uh, problem-based learning and a STEAM curriculum system. We published the five curriculum handbooks already. One of the book, Educating Global Citizens, uh, was published online at our C Network platform. We established uh, five uh, Education for Sustainable Development centers as already. And a successor is a name become a famous brand of study tours, which has attracted more than 10,000 students. Okay, a simple summary. Green Zhejiang case, uh, and you can see, uh, also made a huge uh, contribution for Zhejiang water quality. And you can see uh, the above 
uh, figure. And uh, from the year of 2002 to uh, 2016, water quality is uh, becoming better. And uh, Green Zhejiang's case shows that the civil society plays an important consultative role in the environmental governance in China. And as an NGO, ENGO, Green Zhejiang intentionally adopts the strategy of growing by participation to win endorsement from the state system. And we choose to collaborate with government and media. And education to us is a core approach. Uh, good quality of education for sustainable development to bring the understanding and the trust from the audience, including schools, companies, as well as officials. And uh, anyway, next year, Hangzhou will host uh, Asia Olympic Games. And uh, we want to see you there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Xianhao, for a wonderful presentation. We, we now have uh, about 30 minutes for discussion. And uh, the audience would like to ask you, Mr. Xinhao, two questions. Uh, the first question is how important it is for the government in China to clean the, their water and what is the government doing for helping? Oh, actually, the, I would say government is, uh, they have the main responsibility to like a clean water, it's their duty. So overall, I define our NGO role is not a, a replace of a government, but we can become a very important assistant of our government. And we act over, uh, we can play our own role, like how to mobilize the bottom, so like a citizens to participate in like a water cleanup. So, I will say this is a very important. If we always criticize our government and uh, we think we can replace our government, maybe we can do nothing. But when we define us just our assistant and we get our space, especially, you know, Chinese uh, political system, and we need to get our space and uh, uh, maybe we, we also, it's also for organization itself. And, uh, uh, then other governments or like uh, other companies will purchase public service from organizations as well. So thank you. And uh, the, the second question relates to, uh, you, you spoke about uh, uh, round table meetings that your, your mm -hmm. NGO organizes round table meetings. How do you, how do you choose the general public in these, in these meetings and, and what, what are the criteria? Okay, so young uh, citizens like students always be invited in some roundtable meeting. Uh, like they have their own voices, but sometimes it's just representing some voices. In order to like solve the problem, uh, the most important thing we need to like invite uh, some, especially for government departments, uh, which are in charge of like uh, what I use and uh, they need to come to attend and uh, they need to understand the problem. And uh, at least we need to figure out the, the true problem of the water and uh, to get some solutions. I have a question for uh, actually both of you. I would like to start with uh, Mr. Kartika Sarabhai. Uh, in, in India, what, what mechanisms are in place for civil society organizations engagement in government planning and implementation? Um, as I said, there are several mechanisms. There is the mechanism at the village level of something called the Gram Sabha, where the whole village gets together and, and helps make a decision with the, uh, with the authorities there or the village level elected members. There are the public consultations which go on and public consultations are one which are specific to uh, uh, certain uh, uh, certain individual issues or problems which might have might have arisen. And there you have the judiciary, the government, and the and the people, if you like, working together. You know, a lot of things which come out in terms of the media and uh, people write all the problem. I think there is a watchdog function. I think, as uh, as Shinhao said that in the water pollution area, usually NGOs work very much with the government. 
it's not an area of confrontation because the government's objectives are also very similar. But it might be that a local official might not be performing that role, or there might be an industry which claims one thing but does another thing. So that micro level watchdog function is often done by an NGO and, and, and reports there. But there are many uh, forums where we can do it both formal and informally. Interesting. So, uh, Mr. Shinhao, um, uh, Mr. Kartaka, he, he said that in India they have multiple mechanisms for engagement with NGOs for implementation and, and, and planning. What, what about in China? What, what, what mechanisms are in place for civil society organizations' engagement in government planning and implementation? Yeah, just like uh, you said, uh, you mentioned, like, uh, you know, we, we work with government uh, and sometimes we respect uh, government and give them inspiration. And I use a word, nudge, nudge them. And nudge means push uh, slightly. You know what I mean? So uh, we, we uh, like, uh, like uh, what I mentioned, we, we have a platform for people's uh, uh, like report pollutions. We just mobilize citizens. They, they become collecting information on water pollution. And then I used another word, leverage. We can leverage the authority of provincial government. You see, we have different levels of government, but yeah. we especially work with provincial government. And then I borrowed power from of a provincial government and then to push like a bottom, and a lower level of government. And anyway, uh, regarding to strategy, I will say education for arts is very, very important. And especially in China, you know what? We also use to translate, need to translate uh, like your language into our communist party language. Like we just want, we prefer to use like President Xi Jinping's sentence to uh, like uh, to let people understand uh, and uh, to increase the uh, legitimacy you know what i mean yeah yeah I, th I think i know what you mean you're talking about the implementation gaps uh, yes the, uh, there was another interesting question by uh, from one of the audiences in is it possible for uh, ngos to collaborate with you on projects maybe even in belt and road initiative countries and that question is to Mr. Shin Hao. Can you say it again? I didn't see the questions. Uh, is it possible for international uh, non-governmental organizations to col collaborate with you on projects, maybe even in oh. Belt and Road Initiative countries? Oh, yes, definitely. So like me, uh, so I'm, I'm a council member of Waterkeeper Alliance. Actually, Green Churchill joined the Waterkeeper Alliance like 11 years ago. And we uh, got a lot of support from Waterkeeper Alliance. Even we work with Waterkeeper Alliance, like which I mentioned before, we have H20 Global River Cities Summit. And we also use uh, Waterkeeper Alliance as a very important uh, a platform to invite some mayors from other countries and to come. You know, it also helps Waterkeeper Alliance, you know, uh, the name shows in China and let other people know. And I also say uh, RCE is a very important uh, international organization platform. And uh, because of it, like uh, we can uh, have some uh, experiences and ideas from other countries like India. And you have very good cases and we can use your cases applied in our environmental education. And I think RCE is also a very good network. So that's all interna international organizations and they bring good ideas. But anyway, like I have mentioned before, we need to translate. And the translate not only means like English to Chinese, but also we need to translate into political language. Like we, uh, when I studied in the States, and uh, I like learned some courses about m m uh, NGO management. I learned some concept of uh, stakeholders, lobby, advocacy, 
But I, if I directly say these words in China and I say to Communist Party officials, uh, they will say, your brain was washed by an American. Mm. I need to translate these words. Like mm. we also have democratic meeting in Communist Party. That kind of meeting is a small group of people and they criticize each other or self-criticize. And we just use like a water pollution as a case and that spe specific like a democratic meeting. And this, you know, communist party language. And now it also make a very good story of what the communist party, party did. But originally these concepts just from, you know, uh, stakeholders, lobby and advocacy. So that's what I mean. Thank you. There's a question. There's another question to both of you, and we can start with Mr. Sarabhai. Your NGOs serve the environment, community, and nation. Do you enjoy full support from your governments, or is pollution too much of an unwanted topic? Uh, pollution itself is not uh, unwanted topics, but when you come to specifics, you do run into roadblocks because. Uh, because when you come to the reality, suppose you talk about banning plastic, for instance, single-use plastic was, was banned. And immediately you saw many of the shopkeepers, many of the people who lived off that immediately do protest that, that you cannot do it. Because the minute you come into different stakeholders who's, who, who, who know that they'll be affected if you do this, then you have problems. So it's not pollution per se, but the cause of the pollution, when they find out that it is them who is doing it, then it becomes a uh, conflict. Uh, and, uh, and which is why education or ESD is so important, because unless you can take people with you and explain to you that it is not going to be a loss to development or loss to industry, if you, if you do it this way, it's just a different way of uh, doing it so that we'll all be better, then I think we can move ahead. Uh, so the current uh, Ministry of uh, Water Resources has uh, now consciously had a program where they're working with NGOs to create knowledge centers. Knowledge centers at the national st and state level and knowledge state at the community level. We are working with them. It's a new program which has just started. We will be creating these knowledge centers exactly to see how people can participate better. But the point is that anything which involves a major change does involve some stakeholder getting to feel the pinch. And I think unless you can really work with them, it is difficult. So we have worked a lot with industry, for instance, and, and shown them, we never use the word pollution when we talk to them. We, we say that this is resources flowing out from your factory. If you were to retrieve more, the factory would not. If you recycle the water, uh, you will be better off. So we have to present it, and it's like uh, Shinjao was saying, the language which you use. So the language, Shinjao, which we use with industrialists is different from the language which you use with NGOs because, uh, because they have to concern that it is better, more profitable for them if they do it in a certain different way. And we, we show them and we do demonstrations. And what about in China, Xinhao? Your NGOs, do they uh, serve the environment, community, nation? Do you enjoy full support from your governments? Or is too, pollution too much of an unwanted topic? I think uh, that's, that's common sense, especially when uh, Xi Jinping becomes the president of China. And, you know, we see ecological environment is very important issue, even priority. You know, in my province, even water treatment become a very uh, priority issue for government. So, so I think that's, that's something we, we find in common. And uh, we, environmental NGO has a very, uh, I mean, big, big space. But anyway, we need to uh, get more space for overall. And at least we have different voices. Uh, especially for some problem of a government that didn't, uh, maybe they only concern big problem, but for some tiny problem and uh, community level, we still can contribute to something. And uh, we also want some model like uh, what I have mentioned. We want some model like different stakeholders can be participate. It's also a social governance model. 
it's not only government like manage the society, but we different stakeholders wanted to participate in the process of treating water. Very good. What, uh, I have a question to both of you. Uh, to, to what extent are NGOs and governments in India and China using multilateral frameworks such as UN institutions to guide education policy and programs? Um, I would say that uh, to a large extent, we, we are working just now, I showed one slide about this major plastic pollution project which we work with the United Nations Environment Program, the UNEP. Um, we were very much a member of UNESCO and the whole Education for Sustainable Development which worked out, uh, we were a part of it. So we both in, we influenced it, but also then also use that as a, as a framework. We are using the SDGs very much in our college education to show how water is not a separate process, but water connects with a number of different SDGs and that you have to look at, look at this as, as, a, as a whole. Uh, with UNICEF, for instance, we are talking about school and water and cleanliness and how to save water at, at the school level. So I think the international thinking and the climate change issues, the conventions, very much works with us, but it's not a one-way street. We also influence as, as a country and other things, the way the international thinking is done. So, so we find it as a very healthy relationship. And what about in China, Mr. Xinhao? Yeah, China also uh, signed and uh, participated in a lot of uh, like uh, uh, agreements and like uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity, you know, uh, we, we will have UN biodiversity so meeting in October, uh, this October in Kunming. Uh, yeah, just like uh, Katkaya mentioned as well. So uh, we also, as a country, we, we signed for SDG and uh, China also need to report it to the UN every year. Well, China have done. So that's for us, for, I will say for like an NGO, we can help uh, to organize a lot of Chinese stories over actions to translate into SDG language as well. You know, for, for general public, maybe they cannot understand what is a SDG, but at least we need to uh, reorganize the story and reorganize our efforts to the world to tell stories. We have another question here uh, to both of you, and we can start with Mr. Saravai. Did the problems concerning pollution change within, within the last 20 years? And would you say that the situation improve and has the is, the is the society more aware of the problem now compared to 20 years ago? I would say uh, emphatically yes. I would think that there is, a, there is a huge change. What was considered okay pollution levels, I'm talking about air and water now, even solid waste. What was considered okay 20 years ago and we had to tell people about the harmful effects. Today, people don't need to do that. They themselves are are aware every day in the papers, there's a columns uh, like uh, Xinjiang. We also have um, mobile apps where people can, can, uh, uh, can comment on it. So I think the awareness has, has increased a lot. But uh, the awareness which is required is the indirect effect of what people do on the water, which is what we are trying to do. They might not realize that some action of theirs is actually leading ultimately indirectly to pollution in the water. Uh, very, very, very obvious one they see. So I think, uh, uh, I think while the awareness is there, people are not necessarily fully aware of how their lifestyles need to also change. It's not just a policy change. It's a change in, in lifestyles. Uh, using gray water, for instance, more in any building which you do or something. These are, these are changes which people will need. But the awareness is reached. I think the, the, the next few years you will see much more change happening. Uh, the laws are in place, uh, but we need to actually start doing more uh, as, as citizens. 
And what about in China? How, how has it evolved over the last 20 years? Is it, is it getting better? Yeah, I can feel hugely. Uh, I would say like if I divide the people into two different categories, one is people in political system and the other is like people out of the political system. I, I would say for general public, you know, 20 years ago, remember I bicycled Zhejiang province. At that time, I have, I hold the flag and uh, you know, environmental protection tour. People just asked, what is the environmental protection? You know, at that time, people even didn't have the concept environmental protection. I know even this term in the world is only like uh, around 60 years old. It's quite new. But in China, you know, 20 years ago, people didn't talk about it, have no concept. But today, environmental protection become the topic on the table when people eat and they talk about environment issues. So this big change for general public. And let me talk about people in the political system. I mean, governmental officials, you know, 20 years ago, when I started an environmental NGO, you know, NGO, non-governmental organization. But at that time, 20 years ago, people thought, I'm just uh, against governmental organization. You, you know, that's, that's officials mind. They think, oh, I'm person, I'm bad person. You, you know what I mean? But today I become a hero becomes a country's hero. They give me a lot of awards. And uh, you know, uh, actually tomorrow is the 100th anniversary of the China Chinese Communist Party. And I become a huge hero. You know, these officials treat you very different. So I can feel that. This awareness from bottom and the top. I have a question for Mr. Sarabhai. Uh, are there examples where China and India have engaged in best practice learning on environmental issues? Well, the answer is yes, they have. I've been to China, I've been to China's some of the school systems, I've seen what, what some of the Chinese do, and it's uh, quite extraordinary what many of these things happening as is this as it is in India. And we have been a strong advocate of, of doing some things together, uh, especially if we can get young people uh, to talk to others. And today, because of the net, it will become even more possible uh, for students to talk. What we do is we get students to have a similar problem and there's a great deal of curiosity. How do you, how in your school or in your neighborhood, how do you deal with so-and-so? And we deal with it so-and-so, and you can take things around. So I think just the fact that the COVID situation has made many more people uh, aware of how to use, uh, how to use uh, this medium and, and to connect. We are all connecting today by all being in different places. Uh, and, and earlier we would have planned it maybe as a person in-person meeting somewhere. So I yeah. think uh, the possibilities are, are much more. Possibilities are much more. We need to do more. And mm -hmm. uh, I made my list to Shin how what I'm going to ask him after this meeting is over. Uh, what what are the things I think we can collaborate? So I think it's yeah it's we can do some joint program and we can exchange do a joint program. program. <laughs> we should do some exchange programs and interns. Yeah. <laughs> and I think uh, thank the Hans Simon Foundation for for putting this together. And yeah. if India and China can do it, there's a very large part of the world's population who's mm -hmm. doing something. Mm. And it's very important for. Uh, people at young age, they have mutual understanding. China, India, big country, and we need to solve a lot of problems. Yes, young people could do that. And uh, today, I, I, I also feel parents see this very, very important. And you know, especially a lot of uh, young students wanted to apply uh, universities in the US, in Europe, and they see like students responsibility and leadership, academic background, very important. But when they 
at young age, they participate in environmental actions, and they definitely increase, empower, you know, their capacity. So we we need to work together. Yeah. Sorry, bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh, that, there's one more question to Mr. Sheen. Um, do you have any experience with environmental public interest litigations in China? Would be great to share your insights. Oh, yes. We actually did one case. Like we, we started, uh, uh, did one like in the year of 2017. Uh, and uh, that's the very first uh, uh, lawsuit, like uh, uh, NGO as uh, uh, started in my province. And uh, it's uh, lasted like two years. And uh, uh, in the year, in the end of 2019, and uh, finally we win. And uh, the polluting company got punishment about uh, like three, three million, three million uh, US dollars. It's huge. And uh, that's also we use this case. And uh, the next year we use this case become a uh, students participated uh, in mock court, which I mentioned, and it's based on uh, two case. But we want the students to know uh, more about how to use the, like a law, how to use public interest lawsuit as a very important approach to uh, make something change. Yeah. There, the, another, okay, this is the, the last question and then I will wrap up. Uh, in Western countries like the USA, there has been a dramatic increase in people who believe climate change is fake news. Are such notions increasing in India and China too? You can start with Mr. Sarabhai. Uh, no, I don't think in India you have the climate skeptics uh, in the same way that you have in the US, where you have a very large group of people who don't believe in it. Uh, I think on the whole, we have found that people people see it. First of all, they can they, they understand some of these issues of floods or droughts or, or extreme weather. Uh, you see these news. So I think uh, I'm not seeing the same type of things. I think there's a much more positive approach to try and make a village more climate resilient. Um, uh, and these are the sort of things which when we talk, we don't have the skepticism. What we have just now, which we are fighting is of course, COVID vaccination skepticism. That, that is something which we, we have, but not so much for climate change. And what about in China, Mr. Xinhao? Uh, most of Chinese people think uh, uh, some like uh, uh, American don't believe that uh, they are too political and uh, kind of stupid. You know, this is a good opportunity. Like China today is leading the world's clean energy technology. But why it happened? Because we believe it. We believe that's a big space for, for new technology, for clean energy. You know, we need to explore the new technology and to, to become the leading country. Yeah. So that's my attitude. An answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Karteke Sarabai and Mr. Shenhao for this uh, fascinating di discussion. I will now uh, wrap this up. Um, to summarize, I, I think I have there, there are three points that I that that I have uh, that I have observed. I think that the first one is that. I mean, China and India, they are different countries, but the, uh, they don't represent uniform cultures. That There exists no one-size-fits-all approach to problems, and there are different ways of doing things. And in terms of education and communication, this is best represented by the concept uh, increase your handprint, decrease your footprint, which uh, emerged in Hyderabad by a girl and then it spread in India and it spread globally to countries like Japan and South Africa. And this, uh, <clears throat> it's a tool in the hands of children and students and professionals and it can be modified. And 
applied to different contexts to solve real problems like water leaks, like drip irrigation and so on. And in, in, in China, um, environmental education is used by NGOs to uh, um, facilitate participation, to drive uh, comp uh, legal compliance and also to increase the cost of environmental polluters. Uh, another common theme uh, in both of your journeys, uh, which I identified, is the importance of time. You know, how you take advantage of time and timing, because in both China and India, you, you can have government officials and they only stay in power for a couple of years and then they leave. So it's very important. I mean, both of your examples illustrate that you have, you have a long term, you work you have a long-term strategized approach and, and you need you need time to you need that time to transform polluters into su supporters you also need time to infuse environmental education into every subject and you also need a, a long-term approach to ingrain principles in children who then perhaps one day be in position where they can influence things uh, the second the second point i I identified is that Chinese environmental NGOs, they can play active roles in international agenda settings when they leverage a city's comparative advantage. So I found it very interesting from you, Mr. Xinhao, you know, Green Jiang, you helped create and organize the first ever H20 Global River, Civil, uh, River Cities Summit in Hangzhou in 2018, building on the G20 Summit where you brought together representatives of 20 cities in the world, located on the rivers to share knowledge and pro promote collaboration. And of course, that one reason for that is because you are, I mean, both of you are incredible policy entrepreneurs, but it's also because Hanjo is a city of, um, you know, power of proximity. I mean, you have world-class infrastructure, you have, um, you have e-commerce, you have a rising technology, and it's, it's also clustered around a number of um, competitive cities. So, and you can, you can leverage that as an NGO. And I think that that's, that's really interesting. Um, and finally, um, in India has knowledge hubs for wetland conservation and management, and Indian NGOs are active in solid waste management, but as far as I'm concerned, there exists no water pollution map of India. And, and given, given China's long track record of, in designing and implementing water pollution maps across the country, this seems to be like a, a very promising area for collaboration between perhaps your NGOs or other NGOs, maybe, I don't know. So do you, ha do you have any further, further comments, both of you? I think that is a good idea. The water pollution map is a good idea. We have bits and parts, but it would be wonderful to use the awareness which exists today to put it. And we also have standard measurement tools now which students know. So it would be a very nice thing. And I think it would be nice to collaborate with our Chinese friends uh, to see how we could also do that here. Yeah. Okay. Shake hands. <laughs> Shake hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh... Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kartika Sarabhai and Mr. Xinhao. Uh, and uh, I want to bring to your attention the next event of uh, Hans Seider Foundation, uh, China India Dialogue, which will focus on women and society. Uh, I also would like to request the audience to answer a short survey, which is posted here somewhere. Uh, and, th and thank you for joining us today, all of you. And that concludes this session. Goodbye. <laughs>